Good morning. Good morning, Advent Lutheran Church, near and far. So let us begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
So uh, I hand it on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised from, on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim and so you have come to believe. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruit. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised, imperish imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death? is your victory. Where or death is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Good morning. This morning I have something to share with you. It's a picture of my mom. My mom was wonderful. She taught me all sorts of things, like how to cook and sew, how to be kind to others. She taught me great things, like how to grow in things in a garden, vegetables and fruits and beautiful roses. She taught me about being kind to people and to loving everything in God's creation. Now, my mom died about seven years ago. At first, I missed her like crazy. I cried a lot. And then as time went on, I still really missed her, 
but I didn't cry as much. And I still think about her sometimes. But now when I think about her, it's a little bit of sad and a lot more happy. Why? Because I know that my mom is with Jesus. See, every Sunday when we do our confession, we talk about how Jesus died to take away our sins and so that we can have eternal life. Do you know what that means? That means I'm going to see my mom again someday and my grandparents and my aunts and uncles. And to me, that's the best thing ever. So when someone you know and love dies, it's okay to be sad that you won't get to see them here on earth again. But think about what's coming for all of us. We don't know when, and we don't know what it will be like, but we do know that when that day comes, everyone will be reunited, just like God promised. Even though I miss my mom, it makes me smile to know that she's in heaven with Jesus, and I look forward to the day when I'll see her again. Will you pray with me? Dear God, although we may not understand completely, we know that Jesus died to take away our sins and give us the gift of eternal life. Help us to understand it's okay for us to be sad when someone dies. Give us the courage and the strength to know that we can trust in your promise to us. We look forward to the time when all of us will be reunited in your heavenly kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Paul points us this morning to the very heart of the gospel message. And that message is this. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That precise faith statement gets a bit buried under the many, many convoluted verses that follow it. Paul first lists a chain of witnesses to the resurrection that includes Peter, Cephas, the 12 apostles, a group of 500 witnesses, James, and all the apostles. These people have in common that they all encountered the risen Christ before he ascended into heaven. Eventually, Paul, too, met Jesus, but in a very different manner. He himself told us in one of his letters that he had a vision in which Jesus Christ talked to him and in which he was taken up into the highest heaven where he encountered unspeakable mysteries. The Apostle Paul had a pro has a problem, a problem of legitimacy. Paul is different from the rest of the apostles in that he never sat at the feet of Jesus when Jesus was alive on earth. Paul became Jesus' disciple only after Jesus' death and resurrection. So Paul lacks a significant credential for being a leader, an apostle in the Christian church. Instead, Paul's history with the church is rather checkered and even questionable. One moment he perse persecuted Jesus' followers, the next he claimed to be one of them. It seems as if there were Christians who did not buy into Paul's conversion and Paul's leadership. His response to them was this, I am an apostle, not, not because kind of in parentheses, because I was with Jesus, I was one of the students, rather, I am an apostle because the risen Christ made me one. In complicated times like ours, it is good to be reminded that the heart of the gospel message is very simple. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Christ died, was buried, rose again. His life and death continue the testimony of the Old Testament. Jesus' faith, faith came to pass because of our sins. Jesus died and was resurrected by God so that all who believe in Christ may share in his eternal life. 
a new way of living awaits all who put their faith in and their trust in God and all who look to Jesus as their teacher and savior. That new kind of life, Jesus calls it, calls it the kingdom of God, begins in the here and now and will be fully realized only in the end of days. So let's look for a moment to whom Paul addressed these teachings. The church of God in Corinth, as Paul says in the very beginning of his letter. There is a little children's rhyme that, uh, about the church that you may have learned when you were a child and attended Sunday school, along with some hand gestures. Um, here's the church, and here is the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people. From a biblical perspective, this cute little rhyme is incorrect completely incorrect. The church is not a physical building with a steeple and doors. The Greek word translated as church is ecclesia. All New Testament authors, all included, use the word ecclesia to refer to the gathered worshiping people of God. The redeemed and holy people of God, those set aside, called out of the rest of the people, he calls them a building made with living stones and built upon Christ as their cornerstone. In its earliest days, the church met in many different places. Whatever was available was deemed suitable and safe. Some churches gathered in the Jerusalem temple before it got destroyed. Others gathered in homes or rented rooms. Some even in underground burial cities. Church happened wherever people gathered around God's word and in Christ's name. Only much later, after it became safe to be identified as a Christian, after Roman emperors began, that began sponsoring grandiose church building projects, after church buildings became larger and larger, did the meaning of the church, word church change. Eventually, the word church became associated with building structures. The early Christian community would have said that church would be what you see when you open the doors and look inside of the building, without the people of God gathered on the inside, a church building is no more than a vacant space or an empty tomb. The sanctuary at 5901 San Juan Avenue in Citrus Heights is just a building. It is not Advent Lutheran Church. We are the church. We are Advent Lutheran Church, a community of people whose lives are centered on Jesus, living stones with Christ as our cornerstone. We don't go to church. We are the church. And we are the church not just as our address. We are the church in our homes, in other states, even in other countries. All those who worship with us, are part of our community right now. So does this mean that we should not build physical buildings for the church? Not at all. But it is good to remember that the institutional tools and structures that we have created with human hands and human resources out of wood, metal, bricks, and mortars are merely tools and institutional supports for the spiritual living church, the body of Christ. This is an incredibly important distinction for us. Why? Our primary focus is on the living, organic temple of the Lord. That temple is not closed. That temple is open. As long as we gather to worship, to listen to God's word, 
to pray together, to gather around Christ's altar, and to love and serve in Christ's name, we are open. As long as we have faith, hope, and love, we are open. In fact, Christ's church has never been closed. It is impossible to close church because the church is not a building. We, God's people, are the church. We are open and active. And we will do what is the best and healthiest option for our members to worship together and to stay safe. Amen. As a postscript, though, to the sermon, let's listen to another children's song, sung for us by our own Tom Kent. is not a resting place, the church is a people, I am the church, you are the church, we are the church, together, all who follow Jesus, all around the world, yes, we're the church,
Let us join together and confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he ascended to death. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us now listen to Joel Blaylock as he gives the third of our temple talks. Good morning. My name is Joel Blaylock. And to more, this morning I've, I've been asked to give a temple talk on stewardship. My wife and I have been members here for since 1962 when Melinda was just a young toddler. In 1962, things were a little different than today. I served on committees and with ushering helped. And Carol served as an organist and pianist as, the, as needed. And those years uh, went by and we then got to the point while I was at Aerojet that we could start looking at new homes and we moved to Rancho Cordova and that brought us to the point of, of leaving for a while and coming back later. We served in, at Grace Lutheran for years and other Lutheran churches and came back about 20 years ago, now again, time flies when you're having fun, and I have been asked to speak on stewardship this morning, which I'm trying to get to, and I thank you for listening and seeing me on this, but the reason that, that Carol and I gave was she had the talent to play the organ as needed and the piano, and I loved to sing in the choir and served on committees. And then we've now come to the point of these last 20 years that I have been with family, now watched my family grow with granddaughters, son-in-laws, and grandchildren, and things have moved along. And I now am thankful and want to urge you, this is the first time in my life, this after losing my wife and going through my budget, that I'm in a point that I can finally tithe for the first time, give that 10% or a little more, and I feel good. And I urge you to look at your time and talents and see how you can help improve the church this year. We're in deep need of God's help and your help. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. And it was good to have Carol with us in spirit. Will you please join together? Let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. It seems good to be true, too good to be true, but you have conquered death, O oh Lord, and removed its sting. May this truth give us hope, courage, and freedom to live bold lives as your disciples. God of life, hear our prayers. As one thing dies, another is born. The cycle of death and rebirth is imprinted into your creation. Teach us to let go of what wants to pass on, so that we might embrace 
what is waiting to emerge, God of Life, here yeah. as another academic year, a very peculiar academic year, <laughs> draws to a close and we pause to acknowledge the successes and disappointments of the last year, we give you thanks for all the opportunities you give us to grow. May we take what is good and bring it forward into the future and learn from past mistakes. God of life, yes. okay. our suffering in this life is but the blink of an eye compared with the eternal peace which awaits us. When trials overshadow us, Give us perspective and hope for wholeness perfected in you. Today, on this memorial weekend, we offer prayers for all those who have served our country and died while in service. We also lift up in prayer all those who are on our prayer list who are gravely ill and some of them hanging on by just a bare thread. We lift up all those on the prayer list who are battling cancer. Lord, give all of them strength, the families of those who have perished and those who are battling cancers and other diseases. God of life, yeah. today we celebrate the life of Nicolaus Copernicus and give thanks for the scientists in our midst who study your world and try to make order of it. May we use their discoveries to improve ourselves, our lives and the way we care for the planet. God of life, yeah. risen Lord, you give us hope in all things, and we entrust our prayers to your grace, knowing that you have heard us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, the peace of the Lord be with you always. And, also with you. and I invite you to share Christ's peace with one another in your home, online. And while we do this, you might also want to gather the offering and we will listen together to a song that comes from South Africa to us and is um, based on the Lord's Prayer, sung in different South African languages.
Let us pray together. Because you live, O Lord, we know the joy of your kingdom of life. Bless these gifts we bring out of our gratitude for your salvation and as fuel for your great mission on earth. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right to give you our thanks and praise, O God. For you have called us to a rich hope and a glorious inheritance among the saints. You fix the world in place and rule over all from your sacred throne. You form a people for yourself. And through Moses and the prophets you spoke to them of the Christ who fills all in all. As it is was written, he suffered and was killed, but you raised him from the dead. And he walked again and with his chosen ones, speaking to them of your glorious kingdom. You carried him into heaven on the clouds and made him head over all things for the church, seating him at your right hand far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Therefore, we join with the church in heaven and with all God's people on earth singing, On the night of his betrayal and arrest, as he shared a meal with his friends, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his followers, saying, Share this bread among you. This is my body, which will be broken for, for justice. Do this to remember me. When supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Share this wine among you. This is my blood, which will be shared for liberation. Do this to remember me. God of love, spirit of compassion, bless us and bless this bread and wine. May this meal be food and drink for our journey, renewing, sustaining us, and making us whole. When we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we experience again the presence of Jesus in our midst. The table is ready. All are welcome. Come, for the feast is spread. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to now take the bread and the wine or juice that are in your home and share it with one another or partake of it by yourself, saying the bread of life for all who hunger, the cup of compassion for a broken world.
may this meal nourish us and refresh us. May it strengthen us and renew us. May it unite us and keep us in God's gracious love now and forever. Amen. And let us pray together. God of love, we give, we give you thanks for satisfying our hungry hearts with this meal. Send us from here to reveal your love in the world. Inspire in us the resolve and the courage, the compassion and the passion to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you. Amen. And may the Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you now and forevermore. May, you, may God's Spirit fill you with joy, with courage, hope, and peace. Amen. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Go forth in service, remembering the words of our brother Martin Luther, to fight, work, and pray for the unjust suffering of the innocent in our world. Thanks be to God.